Welcome to Interparty Conflict, the podcast where we answer your questions so you can have the best tabletop gaming experience possible. So at the beginning of our third year of this podcast, what? my name is Gabe. And my name is Jeff. And we're going to answer your questions today. So yeah, Jeff, this is a... Uh, this is the first episode of our third year. That's crazy. So around the time that this episode goes out, three years ago, we started a podcast. Wait. Give, give or take a couple Two days. years ago? Two years there ago. You go. We're in our third we, year. We're in our third. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm confusing myself. Two <laughs> years ago. Yeah, it has not been three like, years. Give me that year back. I want it back. <laughs> right. Yeah. Is this? It's crazy. Yeah. It's that's crazy, right? Um, I don't remember any of it. Yeah. <laughs> so. I still, I still think back to earlier episodes where I'm like, yeah, we knew what we were doing, or we, right. we thought we knew what we were doing, and I'm like, that was like episode five, Gabe. You did not know what you were doing, right? Yeah. Oh man, I haven't, I haven't gone back and listened to the like original episodes because like our form, our format was different. I yeah, think our confidence yeah. was not great. I, yeah. Maybe I don't know. At least mine wasn't. Uh, so I don't know. Actually, I kind of want to go back and listen to those now. I kind of do too. We should do a commentary for uh, <gasps> yes <laughs> earlier episode. <laughs> well, we'll start a new podcast where we. Uh, where we do commentary on our previous podcast. We could call it Outer Party Conflict. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Oh. I uh, I recently started uh, another little podcast project thing that probably won't be out for a very, very long time. Okay. But uh, with our friend Steve. Oh, yeah. And he's, this is, you know, this is really his first foray into podcasting. And so, uh, so like, you know, he's he's going through the same kind of, of like, learning that we are. You know, learning right. to, like... Uh, position yourself in front of the mic yeah, and try yeah. and keeping like your your uh, discussion on topic. <laughs> no, we actually stay pretty pretty well on topic. On this yeah, no, like Steve, Steve is a very focused guy, mm-hmm. so like I don't I don't think there'll be many tangents with him. But sure, sure. But yeah, like yeah, just yeah, knowing to you know stick stick your face in front of the microphone mm-hmm. and keep it there. It's 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 a hard thing to do. Yeah, just like the the confidence you were mentioning yeah. is is something that you do grow into. Mm-hmm. Uh it was really I think the first 3 or 4 episodes I was like just drenched in sweat the whole time. <laughs> uh not because I was nervous, just I have a I drench myself in sweat to <laughs> Keep... <laughs> and anyway, <laughs> that's, that's disgusting. Let's let's move on. Oh no. Um. Yeah. So we uh, we hung out yesterday. Uh, I had you over. Uh, yeah. Steve was over. Skylar was over. Yep. Um. Our friend Peter, who was on the the first arcade stream that we did, right? Yeah. He came over. We played some board games. We played some video games. Yeah. A lot of fun. That was a good time. Yep. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. He uh he defeated us handily at uh, at yeah, Smash Brothers. I was... I was trying real hard, real hard, but I see, just can't do it. I'm, I'm just, I'm not great at that game, and I know Pete's really good. So I was just yeah. like, well, like there, there was a moment where I was like, I'm doing pretty good. I haven't lost a life yet, and then Pete <laughs> noticed that I hadn't lost a life, and he's like, no, that's got to end, and he immediately yeah. just, just demolished <laughs> me. I was like, oh, yeah. Yeah, so uh, anyway, it's just it was fun. We played the game Legendary. It's a board game oh, that yeah. I, I think I mentioned on a previous episode. I played it with our friends down in Georgia. Mm-hmm. And it's a lot of fun. It's a Marvel uh, deck building game. Right, yeah. And it's, you know, cooperative, and it's fun. I love cooperative games. Yeah, they're a, lot, they're, they're a good time, yeah. Mm-hmm. It, there's some sense of competition to it because there's, like, po- there's points that you earn, and whoever gets the most points wins, mm-hmm. I guess. Mm-hmm. But... I mean, like if you if everyone loses, whoever has the most points, I feel like they're like it's like king of the losers. <laughs> king of the losers. Yeah. Like it's almost their fault that they, they, they you didn't <laughs> win because they spent so much time getting points that they yeah. weren't actually, you know, going for the main objective. Sure. Although the main objective is worth a lot of points. Yeah. So, yeah. 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 Anyway. Anyway, um, you want to go ahead and uh, jump into this episode? <laughs> sure. What's uh, what's what? what okay. What's, go- what's going to happen? So, okay. um. Here. I want you to imagine that comes. one day you wake up uh-huh. and you realize the futility of life. <laughs> you realize that someday this will all be gone. Gabe, that's every morning. Every, well, see, <laughs> I'm, I'm pulling from real life here. And you figure, I guess I should just, I guess I should just, just go somewhere. You know where you're going to go, Jeff? Where's that? I guess you're going to go to the Dragon's Horde. <laughs> I mean, I might as well. I'm not getting any younger. <laughs> All right. So, so our item today was uh, it was submitted by uh, Tim D via email, and the item is the first watch. Ooh. It is a ring or a pair of glasses or a timepiece, depending on the era. 
So throw out an era, Jeff. Uh, Neo Victorian tech steampunk. Okay, so it's a, it's a stopwatch. Okay. <laughs> so it's a stopwatch, and you hook it onto your vest, and you put it in a little pocket with a little chain or whatever. Uh, anyway, this is a legendary item. It requires attunement by any humanoid. This flawlessly crafted stopwatch makes the futility of life most apparent <laughs> by slowing time for the holder. So, oh, no. Yeah. Uh, it's, its effect is really simple, though. Choose either a plus five to your speed or a plus one to all ranged attacks. Mm-hmm. It requires one action to change your choice. Nice. And that's it. So you get basically a permanent plus five to your speed or a permanent plus one to your all range attacks. And if you want to, you can spend an action to change it. Swap between them. Okay. Yeah. So you could do it in combat, but you will, you know, personally, I would probably just stick with one. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Just, yeah. You use whatever one's active to your advantage when you get, you know, Mm -hmm. get into combat. Um, Although I feel like with the, the flavor. Yeah. If you slow down time, you'd maybe be able to enjoy life a bit more because you know it's like okay, that's a good if point. If life slowed a down point. a little bit, it wouldn't be it wouldn't be so bad, you know. Okay, well, what if you can slow down time, but you still age at the same rate? Ah, wait. So okay, so you're just you're aging faster. Yeah. To everybody else, you're aging faster. Oh. To you, you're aging at the same speed, but everybody else is aging is is moving slower. Okay. Well, that would. That would suck. Yeah. <laughs> so, but it'd be interesting for a magical item. Sure. Like, yeah. that, that's that's a pretty powerful. It's just you know, it's nothing crazy. Yeah, it's not crazy. I don't know. But if, what what do they have it as a legendary? legendary. I, I mean, I don't know if I would say it was a legendary. Yeah. I mean, it's it's a big deal, but numbers wise, they're not super high. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if 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 it's not really flavor, if it's actually they are like they are going through time like if time is slower to them mm-hmm. they might be able to like notice things like i don't know the dm might be able to say like oh okay like you can actually see that arrow coming sure, like you know sure. you like you don't get surprised by this attack yeah. because you see it coming maybe i think that's i that is reading a lot more into it and sure. that would make it significantly more powerful oh, i think i mean it would tie more towards it being legendary cuz I, I, I feel like that's more like that'd be more rare i think yeah, I could agree with that. Yeah, but but still, cool item and like I I like that's that's got some really good flavor to it that mm-hmm. that can be used. Yeah, um, you know, yeah, not necessarily in mechanics, but especially if it's an attuned item, definitely not legendary because you can only have like what is it two attuned items at a time or something. True. Yeah. So, yeah, I would bump it down. But, is that the uh, case? Is it? Is it? It might. I don't remember how much it is, how many it is, but it's, yeah. there is a limit to how many attuned items you can have. Was that a thing in fourth edition as well? No, they were just. It, I think they were I just more so. strict on like slots or something. Like right, that. right. Yeah. Um, there, there were there was a limit to how many daily powers you could use from items. That's it. That's what I'm thinking of. Yeah, yeah. And okay. then that increased the more like encounters you did in a day or something. Right. Okay. Yeah. So anyway, this isn't a super uh, complicated item. Right. It's pretty simple, but you know, I think it's cool. I think it's. It, I like the theming. I like. I like that it. <laughs> makes the futility of life apparent. Um, that's, that's, yeah, that's a nice touch. Yeah, if it's a legendary, I would I would either bump up the numbers or give it some other abilities mm. or bring it down from being a legendary. Right. You know, well, yeah, you know, if it's if it's like legendary, you know, maybe give it some like maybe the DM can give it some extra abilities. Sure, sure. Based on how they want to interpret the flavor or something yeah. like that. You know, I remember way back when I used to play Mutants and Masterminds. Um, my good friend Nick would. Pretty much every character he had, he would give them uncontrol. There, there. He would give them the precognition power, but with the uncontrolled flaw, uh-huh. meaning that he couldn't use it. It was, it was, it activated whenever the DM wanted it to activate. Sure. And I thought that was an interesting ability to give all of his characters. All of his characters will someday just get random visions that the DM wants them yeah. to have. I think it'd be interesting if they were similarly something that gave the player like time travel or time stop or something, but it was uncontrolled. It only happened when the DM wanted it to. I'm in favor of things, I guess, as speaking as a DM primarily, I, I'm in favor of things that explicitly give the DM encouragement to do mm. things outside of the rules. Sure. Yeah, because like a time stop thing, it could it could be like in a, in a campaign where, where they're not re- they're, they're getting attached to their, their characters and they're not really into like killing off characters and stuff mm-hmm. like that. It might be like 
one of the characters is about to die and suddenly time stops for this other character and they right. can like go and move them out of the way or something. Oh man. Okay. I'm going to go on a, a short tangent, but that's, I think it's okay because this is a short item. Um, so there, okay. This is going to be a weird thing to set up. There's a podcast <laughs> that I've listened to. I haven't kept up with it, but it's called tales from the static. Okay. I could be completely horribly wrong about this, but the I've never looked into it. The impression I've gotten is that this is a, so they say that it is a podcast about, a an 80s horror anthology show similar to like are you afraid of the dark okay and so each episode they go through another episode of this tv show but my impression is that this tv show that they're talking about is not an actual tv show basically it is the creator of the podcast wrote these stories and then is presenting them as if they were part of a tv show nobody's ever heard of huh okay i will look that up and if that is not the case (laughs) i will edit this part out but anyway one of the episodes it was a story about a kid who uh Every now and then, the entire world freezes in time, and he doesn't. And he knows about this. You you come in in media res. He knows it happens every now and then. When it happens, usually he just kind of sits around, waits for it to start moving again. But anyway, it's, it's an interesting story, which is why I'm bringing it up, whether it's part of a TV show or not. I like this story. So it's about this kid. He's sitting around at home. The TV's frozen. He looks around. You know, he's bored. He walks in the kitchen. His mom is frozen in place, like doing some dishes. And he shrugs, opens the fridge, grabs some ice cream or something out of the freezer, starts to eat it. Time starts moving again. His mom looks over and sees him. Oh, I told you not to eat that ice cream. So, okay. Kid shrugs, puts it back in the freezer. And, uh, you know, it, you just kind of get to see how he how he has adapted to living with these completely random freezes in time that affects everybody and everything but him. Uh-huh. So time freezes again. He grabs the ice cream, starts eating it again. He takes a walk to the mall. Sometimes they last a long time. So he walks to the mall. He's walking around the mall and time's still frozen, but he sees there's someone else here that is moving around. Like off the distance, there's some guy that is going around to all the mall people, taking stuff out of their pockets. Goes somebody else, takes something out of their pockets. So this kid plays a little prank on him. He like freezes in place. When the guy gets over, he like jumps on him. Ah! Scares the guy, almost gives him a heart attack. He's like, he's getting old, this guy. And then you find out that this guy has the power to stop time. And he's been stopping time whenever he wants to. And for some reason, this kid is immune to it. So the reason that there have been all of these through this kid's entire life, the reason there have been all these weird, random stops in time is because this other guy is using his power to stop time to go around and, I don't know, I guess steal or whatever whatever you do with, with time freezing powers. So anyway, uh, this kid finds out about this and they sort of talk a little bit, but it turns out that the guy actually is having a heart attack because the kid just scared him. So like time starts moving again. Somebody calls an ambulance. They get in this ambulance. The kid goes with them because he's like, I need to find out who you are and what this is all, what this all means. And the guy, I don't remember what he says to him, but like he says, like, you know, good luck. And then the guy dies. But right before he dies, he stops time. Oh, dang. And the kid is now stuck in a world where everything is frozen, presumably forever, and that's the end of the episode. Oh, jeez. Anyway, but... That that makes me think of how Elminster is immune to time st- to time stop. He is, isn't isn't he? Yeah. So it's like when somebody uses time stop. <laughs> but, it, but I think we've, we've talked about this, and like time stop doesn't affect everything. It's the, not... Well, or, s- different editions have changed the description of time stop. Most of them, you're not technically stopping time you are making yourself move really really fast okay but then because you're talking about in the third edition uh like eberron or not eberron uh forgotten forgotten realms campaign setting book yeah it lists a list of spells he's immune to and one of them is time stop and so we we took that to mean anytime someone anywhere uses time stop he is like oh dang it why did somebody do that right, because so the whole world is he's frozen. the kid the kid is elminster <laughs> right there you go <laughs> i'm see so i'm picturing elminster is in like he's in like a, a potato sack race <laughs> he's like okay <laughs> i'm gonna do this i'm gonna win he's like starting to win and then he gets to the finish line and turns around and everybody is frozen halfway through dang it he has to run back get into a spot <laughs> that was like right around where he was because he can't be too far ahead because they're gonna accuse him of cheating so he has to like stand there on one <laughs> leg in like mid jump until time starts and then hope that he's able to quickly enough get running again get jumping right, yeah. again without someone else overtaking him. <laughs> Time stop made me lose the potato sack race again. Dang it. <laughs> I'll never get that blue ribbon. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> anyway. Oh, so I, if it's not clear, I enjoy, uh, I enjoy things that mess with time. 
in in stories as yeah. well as in in D and D games. It's it's neat if yeah. if used correctly and it makes sense. <laughs> right. I mean, I guess first we- child. Yeah, I haven't. I, I've I've watched a few YouTube videos about that. And it, yeah, it, me it, as, me as well. But yeah, it makes me not at all interested in, in that. Right. Uh, anyway, so within the scope of this item, <laughs> this item doesn't really do any of that stuff, but it could. If you're right. making it legendary. If you're it it legendary, could. you know, you got you got a little wiggle room there. Yeah. You know, here's okay. Here's an idea. Uh-huh. So take this item, but if you're gonna put it in your game and give it to a player. Have it be that eventually it will be the key to some time-based puzzle or lock that they encounter Ooh, at high levels. Yeah. So, like, there might be an adventure, like a, a high-level or epic-level adventure, where suddenly all time has been stopped except for, like, you know, people within a certain radius. or something. So, like, so like the, the player characters are now in a world where everything's frozen in time, and the part of the solution is they have to take this ring or glasses mm. or stopwatch or whatever and then put it into some eldritch machine and get it running again or something right so i think i think this because it's so simple would possibly work better as a plot device yeah for future adventures rather than just an item yeah for sure yeah so anyway so that'll do it for the dragon's horde for today once again that was the first watch from uh, tim d via oh, email the first watch it's a watch. And it's the first one. There you go. There you go. Oh, I got it. I got there eventually. It just sure. took me some time. Good job, John. <laughs> well, uh, let's uh, get this show on the road. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. All righty. <laughs> anyway. Okay. So if somebody wanted to uh, submit a magic item for the Dragon's Horde, mm-hmm. or if they wanted to submit a question for us to discuss or a story for the funeral pyre, how would they do that? They could send us an email at interpartyconflict at gmail.com. Awesome. Uh, before we go any further, we have a giveaway to give away today. Mm-hmm. As always, we're giving away a copy of Chapel on the Cliffs, courtesy of the wonderful uh, content creator Goblin Stone. Goblin Stone is a uh, collection of... of uh, content creators, I believe, based in the UK, and they've made several great adventures uh, on websites like DMs Guild. But uh, here, Chapel on the Cliffs is the one we're giving away. It's a low-level fifth edition adventure. And uh, Jeff, who is our winner today? Our winner today is Brandon Blue. Whoa, 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 winner! Gobble, gobble, gobble! Yes, congratulations, Brandon Blue. You're my boy, Blue. <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure he's never heard that one before, Jeff. Yeah, I bet. <laughs> so, uh, um. Yeah, you should be getting that in your email uh, relatively soon, you know, within the next few days. If you haven't gotten it in maybe a week, let us know. And, uh, yeah, be sure to let Goblinstone know what you think so that mm-hmm. they can continue to make uh, great products. Yeah. And if anybody else wanted to enter this drawing, Jeff, how would they enter? They could send us an email at interpartyconflict at gmail.com with the subject line, Chapel on the Cliffs. Awesome. And then anything in the body, you can say, congratulations on 100 episodes. You can right. say, uh, I hate you. <laughs> Please don't, but you can. You feel free, but <laughs> don't. Your show is bad and you should feel bad. <laughs> exactly. Or, you know, send me a picture of a, of a turtle or something. There you go. Send us a picture of a turtle. I I mainly handle the email, but I will pass it on to Jeff <laughs> yeah. if, uh, if we get any pictures of turtles. Uh, so in addition to that, I want to tell everybody that we are brought to you by our wonderful patrons. Mm-hmm. We have a Patreon at uh, patreon.com slash interpartyconflict. We've got some great rewards on there for anybody who wants to help donate to the show. Mm. We've got... Uh, fantasy fiction that I write every month. We've got outtakes. We've got bonus episodes. We have. Let's. I. I'm trying to start to think of it as we have a monthly bonus podcast for our sure. listeners. Interpatron conflict. Yeah. So uh, every month we come out with a bonus episode. We'll probably be recording one of those within the next few days. Mm-hmm. Uh, we've got a monthly roll twenty game run by either me or Jeff. Uh, for our top tier patrons, and also if you're a top tier patron, I will write about your character for the uh, fantasy fiction. Mm. So. Yeah, I, I've I've written some. I think I've written some pretty good stuff in the last year. I'm really proud of the last couple in particular. So yeah, if you want to become a patron, it's only a dollar to get all the fantasy fiction and the outtakes. So you can you can donate to us, you know, any amount you want, but you'll you'll get bonus content and help make the show better. Right. So yeah, patreoncom slash conflict. Yeah. Also check out Crit Academy, CritAcademy.com. It's a great great podcast with uh, Justin, Ian, and Brandon. They create new and reusable content for players and DMs alike. And D&D Character Lab, they make characters and then pit them against each other to debate whose character is better. So enough of that. Do you want to jump into some questions, Jeff? Sure. All right. Our first question comes from Preston Penguin. 
Uh, this was on Discord. How do you mentally prep for an upcoming session? Yeah, I thought this would be um, I thought this would be an interesting question because this is I have a a pretty big session that's going to be coming up in the next few days. Oh yeah, and you've been running some games for the the Roll Twenty, which I mentioned in the last couple of months. So I was uh, I was interested in what your process was, and also I would talk about what my process was, and you know, a lot of drinking. Okay, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, you don't you don't want to be drunk when DMing. Sure, that's not, sure. That that's not going to be helpful. You know, if I mean, obviously, if you're of age mm-hmm. and of sound mind and reason. You know, a little, a little, uh, a, you know, a little tongue loosener. Yeah. I mean, do, do, do whatever, whatever makes you most, uh, most comfortable, I guess. But, right, but yeah. remember you are going to be yeah. speaking to a large group of people. So You're handling lots of information. Yeah. You know, so, you so use, use your best judgment. Yeah, you know? yeah. Yeah. I mean, so the idea is to try, try and loosen, loosen up a little bit. Sure. Um, you know, don't. Uh, I mean, we talked about this before. Don't over prepare. Yeah. Um, but so like one of the mistakes I did is like, I was like, I'm like, I'm going to have everything out in front of me <laughs> just so I have it all here ready to go. Yeah. Cause like, I like the, I think the first time I didn't have everything out and ready. So I was like fumbling through papers and stuff trying to yeah, find it. Yeah. And I was like, crap. All right. And then I was like, all right, this time I'm going to be prepared. I'm going to put everything out and just all over my desk. And then it was all over my desk. And I was like, <laughs> I don't know where anything is. Yeah. So it's, you, you, you want to you want to pack for the trip, but you want to pack light. You sure. Know? So like, just have what you know you're like you know, figure out exactly what you're gonna need. You know, you want to kind of put things in order. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. you know, don't have to have everything out at once. You just got to like, okay, they're gonna be in this area first. This is what I need for this. Yeah. And then you know, and then like the next three areas that they could potentially go, I'll put them neatly in a pile over here. You know, so. Prepping your area is nice. Yeah, I mean everybody's gonna have their own, uh, their own like, what's the word I'm looking for? Everybody's gonna have their own organization style. Yeah, but do you know do whatever you got to do to to organize everything. Now it is mainly talking about like mentally preparing, but I, sure. I do think that physically preparing is important too. Yeah, well, I mean, because like when you when you when you're physically prepared, you're you know you're gonna be a lot calmer mm-hmm. in your mind mm-hmm. for sure. Um, Although again, like you know, under preparing and over preparing cause me more stress. So. Sure, sure. Uh, uh, yeah, it's I when I when I'm dealing with like uh, NPCs and characters and stuff, I practice voices because mm-hmm. like I want to try to have at least a few voices to, sure. that I could do to, to differentiate different characters. So I like I practice those things in the car, be- mm-hmm. you know, before mm-hmm. a session, that sort of thing. So like you, you get a little bit more comfortable with it. Yeah. Um. Yeah, just kind of running over things in your mind. Uh, I don't know. Like, I mean, I've I've only done the two sessions, so sure. So like that, like I, I, you know, I, I haven't quite hit. You know, I haven't, you haven't quite, quite hit, uh, mastered it yet. Right. Yeah. So like, those are just a few things that I've tried doing. Sure. Not ex- not exactly sure if they're were they were successful in any way, but uh, but yeah, that, that's that's at least what I tried doing. Yeah. Uh, for me, there's a healthy amount of panic. No, no matter okay. <laughs> no matter how prepared I am. Sure, yep. <laughs> um I am rarely able to get anything meaningful done in the last hour before a game. However, the eh, maybe 3 or 4 hours before then I can usually get get quite a bit done. Um I try to run through my head like what the what the goal of the session is going to be, whether mm-hmm. it's, you know, to get the players from one end of a dungeon to another end of the dungeon or to introduce characters to a new location or some NPCs or something. Um, I do try to, I do try to think about each of the NPCs, how I can, you know, think of them in like once in one sentence in my head, like who is this NPC so that I can refer back to that sentence to get an idea of how to play them. If the players, you know, want to talk to that NPC or whatever I do. I know it is mentally. I wasn't trying to say like, you're, you're doing something wrong by saying physical stuff. Right. Uh, even when I am mentally prepping, like I, I, there is a lot of physical prep that is required too. Um, I, I always like to have a bunch of names on hand, whether yeah. I plan on there being NPCs or not. Just getting, getting names. We, we did like a little uh, session zero point five the other day for this thing we're doing soon, and uh, we did it on on Google Hangouts the other day, and I, I didn't have names prepared, and so I kept having to quickly refer to this online uh, name generator, right? And, yeah. 
I mean, it, it just slowed the game down a little bit because I kept having to refer to stuff. And we mentioned last episode that, like, names are always going to sound stupid. So, yeah, uh, don't be afraid if the name sounds stupid. Just just pick a name. Move on to the next one. As yeah. long as it's a name you can remember. Yeah, pick a name and stick to it. A name becomes a name. Like, yeah. at first, it's just a word you've never heard before. Mm-hmm. And then eventually, it's a name that, you know, invokes, oh, yeah, this is that person. Yeah. So, you know, like... You know what? What is a you starts off as a joke name usually becomes something something else. Yeah, yeah. So, um, just kind of run through your head what what you want the players to do this session, mm-hmm. and then try and maybe workshop uh, what solutions you think the players might come up with. Sure. Try to you don't necessarily have to have a solution prepared, but try to think. Well, if they're gonna do this, what are some possible things that might happen you know i was just thinking and any if you, you go down your entire list of npcs mm-hmm. and ask yourself what would happen if they killed this person that's a good question <laughs> yeah <laughs> so like what would happen if they killed this person what would happen if they tried to seduce this person what would they ha- what would happen if they tried to steal from this person yeah you know like those those are those are a few of the of the many questions you should ask about each and every individual NPC just in case because it's gonna happen. Good point. Good point. Um, if you if you do have like stat blocks for NPCs or for monsters that you plan on using, just read over each of them. Mm. Make sure that if there's something that you uh, may not have noticed before, like all the time, I forget abilities that monsters have. Yeah. And I mean that's probably gonna happen whether you read over or not, yeah. but it'll happen less if you do. If you got time, do like a do like a little drill. Yeah, for for like for the monsters, you know, just to, you know, just because having to like reread a stat block in the middle of a battle is always going to just bring everything down. So. Sure. Um, if it's just a matter of like, if if the question is is basically asking like, what what do you do for like peace of mind? Because um, I I said I do I do panic quite a bit before <laughs> every session. Um, because I know I'm not going to get anything meaningful done during the last hour. I try not to even try. Sure. Like I might just watch some videos on YouTube or something. Yeah, you know, yeah. Maybe play a game for 15 minutes or whatever while you're waiting for people to get over. Yeah, just getting a cl- yeah, clear headspace. Yeah, I mean, you want to make sure that you at least have all of your books and stuff nearby so that you don't have to, like, be running to get stuff during the game. But once you've got everything in place, don't don't stress over it. Like, I've yeah. heard people say that before a big test, you could stay up all night cramming or you could maybe stay up, like, an hour cramming and then just get a good night's sleep. And yeah. you'll, you'll have a clearer mind after sleeping... And you'll be able to retain the stuff that you did. You'll be able to remember the stuff that you did cram before that. Yeah. Whereas if you stay up all night cramming, you're very likely to forget the stuff that you learned because you didn't sleep. Yeah. I mean, there are actual s- sleep studies that go into like when your m- brain is asleep, that mm-hmm. is when it's kind of building the memories. And yeah. That sort of yeah. Thing. Uh, so, yeah, it might be like, OK, like get everything set up an hour beforehand and then mm-hmm. take that last hour before the session. Just, just, just yeah, relax. Let's go relax. Go grab a snack. Go, you mm-hmm. know. Just kind of do, just do something, do something Zen. You yeah. Know? Yeah. I mean, that, that's the best advice I can give. I don't always do that, but right. whenever I do, I feel better about myself. Whether, whether I feel good about the game or not, well, that's to <laughs> yeah. be decided, but I feel, I feel good about myself. I yes. Guess. I always, I always think about giving myself an extra hour, five minutes before the session starts. Of I'm course. Like, I should give myself an hour. Hold on. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Uh, I should, I should, I should get a full night's sleep. All right. Hey guys, uh, I know we're supposed to play in an hour. I'm gonna get a full night's sleep. See you in an hour. <laughs> see you in, see you in six to eight hours. Yeah. Okay. Our next question comes from Happy Gilmore through email. Okay, so here, this is like a little scenario here. Yep. Uh, the other party members are arguing over whether to open the door. The DM looks ready to kill somebody if they don't just make a decision and do it. I could just go ahead and open it myself, but if I do, I'll probably get attacked by whatever's on the other side. What should I do? Yeah. Uh, that Yeah, that is one of those, uh, <laughs> like, yeah, the DM's just waiting for the party to make a decision and says something as simple as opening a door. Yeah. Because, like, w- when you're in that situation... You are not the character. You are the player. You were thinking of okay, what can be behind behind that door? Yeah, the, the, you know, it could be anything. All right, so no, you got to you go in first. No, you go ahead of me. No, I'll stay in the back, and I will, you know, no, but, but no, we crap, it's locked, so we have to have the rogue up front doing the lock pick. Okay, no, so I'll stand, I'll stand by the side of the, and, and meanwhile, the DM's just like, there's nothing behind this door. I know, I've been there's in that, I've been in that position. Door. I've been in both the DM's position and the player's decision in that case, uh, position in that case, <laughs> so many times. Now. We talked a few episodes ago about metagaming in regards to, like, focus fire and stuff. Sure. We actually had a 
good long discussion about that on the Discord because I, I, I had to explain exactly what I meant by by it being metagaming. Sure. Um, anyway, it's not really discussion <laughs> for here, but um, I, it is metagaming to sit there and think about, okay, well, there's probably an enemy on the other side of this, so let's get all in position and so on and so on. I'm not saying your characters wouldn't do that, right? but you, the player have a good idea because of your genre savviness, have a pretty good idea that there are going to be some sort of hazard. There's going to be some sort of hazard on the other side of that door. Yeah. So being overly cautious, although it would make sense for a character to be overly cautious because it's their life that is, yeah. that they're being cautious with. Right. Uh, that is a pretty meta game thing because you are stepping outside of what would a realistic person do? And you're saying, this is a game we're trying to win. And I'm not going to win if I die. Yeah. So we need to make sure that we do everything as calculated as possible. That's just something players do. It's not a bad thing. Yeah. It's not a metagaming is not inherently a bad thing. Just want to make absolutely sure I say that. But these sort of of situations come up when the players are overthinking a scenario. Yeah. If you are the adventurers, depending on what your motivation is, if you're trying to rescue somebody or just look for treasure or whatever you're going to approach it in a more realistic fashion. The big tough guy who likes bashing down doors is probably going to bash down the door. Right. Yes, there might be a monster on the other side. And yes, he's going to want to survive fighting a monster on the other side. But a big dumb barbarian is not going to be like, okay, everybody, let's discuss what is the best way to approach this door. Let us decide who should be standing where when we open up this door and who should be pushing open the door so as to best maximize our uh, effectiveness in the upcoming potential combat. Yeah. That That is all metagaming because we as players, we've been in situations like this before. We know what's probably going to happen because of previous games we've played or fiction we've read or, or movies we've seen or whatever. Mm-hmm. So it is the player's thing to overthink stuff like this. Yeah. Also, we as players don't have our characters' senses. The DM can explain what our characters see and hear and smell and so on better than... or that they The DM can't... They can try to explain it all, but they're not going to do as good of a job as a person actually being there. Right. So we, again, are looking at it through a, a screen of abstraction. We are not taking every little thing that is going through the character's mind... At the time, you know, we we have knowledge the character doesn't have, the character has knowledge we don't have, so we are coming at it from a completely different viewpoint than a person in that situation actually would. Mm-hmm. Now, so it's it's just natural that we would metagame because of, like I said, we've seen movies, we've played games, and so on. But I'm always a fan of somebody who's just like, my character would just bash down the door. Roll to bash down the door. Right. You know. Yeah, I've been I've been in situations on, on the player side mm-hmm. both ways where I'm just like I'm just gonna open the door, sure. And then where other I'm like no 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 don't open the door <laughs> don't open the door why would you why would you do that you know something that came up actually when you talk about like the dumb barbarian who just bashes down the door yeah like the dumb barbarian like cliche mm-hmm. like it's almost like that's a character it's it's almost a throwaway character yeah in the way that you're just gonna throw it at a door. And it might just, he might just die, but it's yeah. the ones that survive that be, that become <laughs> like famous in like, when you're telling a t- when you're telling the tale of your D and D adventures, mm-hmm. you know, like, oh yeah, crunk number 340, you know, five, right. You know, like bash through the door and became crunk because he made it through and survived, you know, like, mm-hmm. he, you know, he wasn't just another, you know, meat shield, you know, with a hammer. Right. Um, a character I, I a character I was playing, uh uh her name's Myrtle, she's a little halfling, old, yeah. old lady halfling. I get like because she's just an old lady lady and she just doesn't care anymore, she just goes up and knocks on doors. Yeah. It's like because like if while you guys are all just arguing about whether or not to open the door, I'm just gonna go knock on it. Mm-hmm. You know, maybe we'll get a nice friendly answer from the goblin behind the door. I don't know. Right, or, right. Another idea I just came I came up with was slide a note under the door. It says <laughs> That's like a good one. Like, do you like do you like me? I Y N, you know? Like friend door <laughs> foe. Check the box. Yeah, check the box and they slide it back <laughs> and it's explosive runes. Oh goodness. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, uh j- one one more thing, because what you were saying about like the the barbarian that survives is like that's how they become the the barbarian everybody remembers. Um, 
yes, your character wants to survive, so you can argue that it would make sense that your character would deliberate over whether to open a simple door. Yeah. But at the same time, if all your character wanted was to survive, they wouldn't be adventuring. Sure. They would be staying at home. Yeah. They would work at the mill. They yeah. would <laughs> just live like a peasant. Yeah, but your you, character is an adventurer. Right. They're going for glory. They're going for glory. They're going for, for wealth. They're going for power. For knowledge or or because they really just need to save that person or something sure. like that. It's sure. like, I'm going to go to whatever lengths I need to go to to rescue so-and-so. A door is not going to get in my way. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm not going to let that stop me. Yeah. And you also got to remember that you as the player, you are not playing necessarily to survive the game. You're playing to have a good time surviving the game. Sure. And you could also survive the game by saying my character is going to go back to town and work in the mill. But that's not fun. <laughs> that's not fun. That's right. It's, it's more fun to bash down the door, even if it means you're going to get attacked. <laughs> the, the, the other, the, uh, in the, in the uh, campaign I'm playing Myrtle, the other players uh, referred to her as Grandma No. <laughs> okay. Grandma No! Because... <laughs> That's that's kind of that's kind of I just I just with that character I'm just like I'm just gonna do a thing yeah because it's gonna move us forward and it's gonna be fun yeah you know like oh there's two figures hunched over hey how you doing over there oh they're not people they're ravenous dogs <laughs> grandma no <laughs> yeah so like I I do occasionally have times where I am as indecisive as the next guy yeah but I I'm always in favor of. I don't want to sit here for 10 minutes arguing about whether open the door, I mean, whether we're going to open the door. Yeah. Let's just open the door and then deal with whatever's on the other side. Yeah. And it it's like the longer it is, the more likely, the longer you sit there and think about what's behind the door, the more likely the DM's just going to be like, okay, the door opens and there's a you know fire-breathing dragon and it kills you all immediately. Yeah. Roll characters again, please. Now, there is another read to this, uh-huh. and that is if the other party members are arguing in character about whether to open the door. Sure. Let them argue in character. Yeah. Like if it's the players that are, you know, arguing over play styles, that's one thing. And yeah. you should just, that's when you should just be like, guys, I, I opened the door. I already did it. Yeah. You know, but if the players are making arguments in character about what, like their actual reasons for wanting or not wanting to open the door, if I'm the DM, I kind of want to encourage that because they have, they, if, if they have actual reasons for what they're arguing, yeah, I want them to, to, Come to a conclusion on their own. I don't yeah. want to be the one that's like, whoa, 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 stop role playing. We got to get into combat. You know what although, I mean? Although when, when when you get into an argument, sometimes the the lines blur. And that's like that's you, true. You that's true. Dip in and out of character and stuff like that. And usually, right. you when you end up out of character, you stay out of character and start arguing tactics and stuff like sure, that. Sure, sure. But yeah, no, you're right. Yeah, if it's if they're doing it in character, that's they're, they're playing the game. Yeah, they're yeah. having fun. Um, and then, you know, you can also as the DM, if you, if you're still thinking it's taking a little too long, they're arguing out loud in their care in characters at that something's point, something's going to happen. Something's yeah. going to happen. Like somebody comes <laughs> from around the corner or you know, opens the door and says, would you guys mind like keeping quiet? Like yeah. what's going on out here? <laughs> like, it's just, it's or, just an old, old person trying to take a nap or like one person in between the two PCs that are uh, arguing. One, one of them says like, I think we should open the door. The other one says, I think we should not open the door. And like everybody else is like saying, yeah or no. And then like they hear a, yeah. And then they look over and it's an orc. <laughs> He's staring. like, yeah, open the door. Open the door. <laughs> What's in there? Yeah, it could just be like one of the mook orcs of the, of the <laughs> right. and he's never been in there and he wants to know what's in there too. Sure, sure. So he just joins in. That's yeah. good. So uh, <laughs> I, I say open the door. Yeah, if if you if you want to open the door, if you feel like your character wants to open the door, if he has reason to open the door, or if you just, just want to keep the thing moving, mm-hmm. like you're, the DM's going to like you yeah. for that. Yeah. The players might not like you for that. But eventually they'll come around because it'll be a good time. Yeah. You know, in in the adventure zone, uh, they're pretty early on. One of the players, Travis McElroy, uh, he establishes that his character Magnus, like sort of his his credo is Magnus rushes in. And I would say over the course of the campaign that that stays pretty constant whenever uh-huh. there is a disagreement about like, oh, well, should we go in? Should we not go in? Magnus, Magnus rushes, rushes in. in. Okay. And uh and like I I think that every party can benefit from a Magnus rushes in even if sometimes it it means everybody dies. That sucks, but it's more interesting than standing there and arguing over who should have g- gone in the door, you know right, what I mean? Right, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I I I just feel like 
most DMs are going to reward the people who actually act instead of uh, yeah. instead of think. Or I mean, not th- like you can act and think. Right. Like think thinking instead of acting is generally looked down upon by DMs, whereas acting whether you're thinking or not is going to move the game along. Right. Yeah. You know? Moving forward progression. It's, it's, it's going to be, it's going to be better for everybody. Yeah. I mean, I, like maybe your character might die, but sure. at least things are going to happen. Stories are going to unfold. Mm-hmm. You know, you can always make a new character. Yeah. You can always put J, you know, JR next to the, you know, <laughs> yeah. your character's yeah. name and just keep going. <laughs> but wait, the previous character was, uh, was a half orc and this one's a, uh, an elf. Oh no! Mm-hmm. Oh uh, well, adopted, adopted, sure. <laughs> right. So if you just act mm-hmm. instead of thinking, like you know, if you're not, if the if the players don't stop at the door, discuss everything, yeah, and instead just go in, sure, surprise round. Like if there, there is go. something, yeah, more likely to get a surprise round. If you're standing outside the door trying to figure out, well, how should we go in there? There's more mm-hmm. of a chance that the DM is going to be like, okay, they know you're behind the door now. Yeah. One of them is standing in your party telling you to open the door. Right. <laughs> yeah. The, the orcs, he's right there. But no, like if you're just like, okay, there's probably guys on the other side of the room. Everyone agreed. Okay, let's go. Yeah. Like just, just get in there. Like everybody knows what their characters can do. Mm-hmm. Like you don't really, like there's going to be time in battle to discuss tactics. Oh, absolutely. You know? Yeah. Battle. I mean, everybody argues about how, Everybody says that battle is is like with the longest part of the game. So you're not going to be rushed when it comes to yeah. if you're like the third person in combat, you got a good 10 minutes before, you yeah. know, before you have to do anything. Yeah, it's like a, like a quick description of what your tactics are going to be, mm-hmm. you know, before uh, an adventure even starts. Because like, I'm the rogue. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hide and throw daggers. Sure. Or it's like, all right, I'm the barbarian. I'm going to rush in and hit things. It's like, I'm the, you know, I'm the wizard. I'll, you know, I'm going to stand back and shoot. You know, it's like, okay, everyone agrees what's going to go down. All right, so let's just rush in. We get a surprise round. We'll probably win at that point because yeah. we're the players. Like, like that, 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 when we came into the, the challenge rating discussion where it was like the, the time we had, a, we had a surprise round, uh-huh. we dominated. Yeah, yeah. Same challenge rating, didn't have a surprise round, and it didn't go so well. Right. So, like, you know, that's just, if you just act, you might you yeah. get an advantage in, in a lot of cases. Yeah, so I say even if you're going to get attacked by what's on the other side, Go ahead and, and bash I mean, the door down. That's what they're there for, to to yeah. to, to fight. <laughs> right. That's what monsters are for. Uh, just one more thing about... Uh, uh, so Magnus rushes in. So the three, the three members of the Avengers are there. Magnus, Merle, the cleric, and then Taco, the wizard. Uh, Taco. The, the extended credo is Magnus rushes in, Merle follows after, Taco's good out here. <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty good. Yeah. Okay, our next question comes from Sean. This was on Facebook. How do you introduce information about a fresh world to PCs or even players for the first time? Yeah, and the um, there's a little bit of context for this, and I also like I personally have have uh, I have I have stuff to sort of include with this question. Yeah. So I want to I want to try to address uh, like the the type of of response to this question that Sean was looking for, and then I also want to talk about a bit more broad sure. as well. So Sean was was telling me that he in his, the game that he's going to be running. The players are going to be all drow, or at least they're going to be from the drow, like where the drow live. And I guess the, uh, the where the drow live, like the underdark or whatever, has been like disconnected from the surface world for a long time. So they're going to be coming up to the surface world, mm-hmm. and there's going to be a lot of stuff that's new to them. Another thing about this campaign world is that the the players have never seen a human before. Okay. So when they get to the surface, there's going to be humans, and they're not going to know what they are. So do you tell the players right off the bat, hey, uh, you don't know what humans are because humans didn't exist in the past. Like back when back when you went to the Underdark and then got cut off from the rest of the world, there was no such thing as humans. And so now when you see humans, they will be new. You could say that. You could also, the suggestion I gave him was that just mention to them what races they're familiar with. You don't necessarily have to specify that you did not point out humans, but you could say, oh, yeah, you're familiar with orcs, you're familiar with elves, you're familiar with halflings, gnomes, tieflings, dragonborn. Okay. And then canny players might notice, oh, you didn't say humans. Maybe they'll ask and you can say, oh, I I don't know. Did I say humans? I don't don't know. (laughs) Uh, But then when you encounter, when the players encounter a human for the first time, you could, instead of saying, it's a human, but you don't know what a human is. You could say that. Right. That's less interesting than instead saying, uh, well, you see, they look kind of fatter than elves. 
their skin is this like sickly pink. Yeah, they're like, their they're... ears look like someone cut off the ends of them. Mm-hmm. They're you know they're definitely hairier than elves, yeah. but not quite as hairy as a dwarf. Definitely taller than a dwarf. Sure. Yeah. So with something like that, that's a detail that it's gonna come up in the game, and it would be cool if that had some sort of an impact. Yeah. But without specifically telling the players, hey, there aren't humans in this world. Right. And there's going to be humans in the world. Yeah. Without specifically telling that, there isn't really a way to get them invested in that idea. Sure. Similarly, when I played in the campaign where I was playing as my character Artemis Red Sleeves, there was a detail the DM told us at the very beginning, in this world, there is no such thing as resurrection magic. He told that to us, and I didn't quite know the impact that that was going to make. The idea that I took was, oh, he's just trying to tell us that if we die, we can't come back. And so I took it a different way than maybe he intended it. But what he intended it for, I think, is that halfway through the campaign, we find basically the first scroll of Res- of Ray's Dead. Okay. And so that the way he did it, that was kind of a big thing because he told it to us in a way that I took it so that I took it to be mechanically and that that meant something to me because like, oh, I'm concerned about the mechanics. If my character dies, I want him to be able to come back. So the fact that I can't right. is meaningful to me. Yeah. If he had said it as, there's no way to to bring people back from the dead yet, and then, like, you know, if he had, like, hinted that that was what he was going to be doing with it, I think I would have been a lot less interested in that. I would have been like, okay, sure. well, when are we going to get the thing that lets us not have to worry about dying? Um, Spreading this question out a little bit about how do you get information to the players about the world, it's a tricky thing because the more information you give the players about the world at the beginning of the game, the less they're going to pay attention to it. Mm -hmm. Like if I tell you you're on a desert island, you've only ever seen people that are just like you, you know, you're like part of a race that lives on this desert island, go. Right. You'll probably be able to, you know, pick up on that. Okay, you know, I live on a desert island. I probably have stuff made out of like sticks because that's the only material we have to work with. Sure. So on and so on. And then when I say you see this weird... uh, You see like a a weird individual that has a different color skin than you and he's got like horns on his head and he's wearing these weird vestments made out of uh, uh, animal animal components and so on. That's going to be interesting to you. If instead I was like, okay, strap in for this. So you're on this desert island. Its name is... uh, uh, Kambala and uh, 30 miles to the north there's this this human nation with all of these airships and so on and so on and then the lineage of the king was this and the more the more I go with the less you're going to be interested because like you don't right. care you're you what what difference does that other continent yeah. mean to you in the context of your character it means nothing exactly it, you know it, it means everything but it means nothing right like it's it's been tricky with my own campaign world because i started making my own campaign world a bunch of years ago back but around when fifth edition came out i started making this campaign world and as a writer and i'm trying to think of like okay what's what stuff i can do to like make it stand out from a narrative standpoint Mm -hmm. i do come up with little details about the world that do make it different but i don't know a way to tell that to players and have it be meaningful for example this is a weird detail and i i have almost never brought it up because it feels weird to say But in my campaign world, a week is six days instead of seven days. In Faerun, a week is ten days instead of seven days. Right, yeah. But you got to ask, if you tell that to a player, what difference is it going to make to them? Sure. Unless you make the game all about that, it's probably not going to make a difference at all. Yeah. So how do you tell them that without them feeling like it's just some extraneous information and therefore not important to remember? (laughs) Or is that something that they can exploit? Like, you know, it's like it, I suppose if they have like a magic item that refreshes once a week or something so like you that, can use it more often because yeah. of the world that you're in or something, you know. So it, it is hard to know what information to give players. If you give a player a 200 page encyclopedia about what this campaign world is, there, it's going to be hard, especially before the campaign starts. Yeah. I guarantee you nobody's going to read that. And if they do read it, they're not going to remember 90% of what they just read. Yeah, and the, and the 10% that they do remember might not have anything to do with what's going to happen in the campaign at all. Exactly. They might have, they might have like, stuck to one thing, like, oh, that's really interesting, and then find out, like, oh, no, that's something that happened, you know, hundreds of thousands of years ago in that world and is not really relevant. Sure. Let me try it this way. Let me, let me think of it this way. If you, if I were to say to you, okay, Jeff... Here's a book that's an encyclopedia of this world that I've been reading about, 
and it tells you about the magic spells people's cat people cast. It tells you about the uh, the monsters that live in this world. It tells you about the factions. It tells you about all this stuff. Go and read it. You might go read it. You might not. Mm. But if I instead hand you, hey, here's Harry Potter book one. Try reading it. And you start reading it and you immediately learn about the characters. And then you learn about Harry Potter and then where he's going to go to school at Hogwarts and then the drama and all that. And then after you've read the first book or maybe the second book or third book, I'm like, hey, here's a book that's all the lore about the Harry Potter world. You would probably be like, yeah, I'm interested in finding out what what all the spells are. I'm interested yeah. in finding out what all the monsters are mm-hmm. because you're already invested. You don't want to overload people with information before they care about the characters. Right. Yeah. So I think that if you, if you are going to make your own campaign world, and I've been trying to do this myself, if you are going to make a campaign world, only give the players the information they need to start playing their character. Yeah. Let them play their character for a few sessions at least, and then give them more information about the world. You know, they're not going to care what the next continent over is like, mm. probably until they are in a position where they can go to that continent and their their character has things to gain from going to that continent. Then it's going to be important to them and they will be more interested in learning, more invested in learning what what's there. Yeah. And they'll, but they'll more importantly, they'll be learning that in character. Hopefully. Yeah. 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 So generally speaking, when you're trying to figure out what information to give players, give them as little give them the the minimum possible so that they can play their character. If there is something that is going to come up in the first session, try and introduce them to that. I've been trying to to tell you guys about the city you guys are going to be starting in. Uh-huh. If there are important factions, I want you guys to know what the important factions are. But generally speaking, like I want to introduce all the NPCs while you're in character, so that you as your character can make a decision about how you feel about that character. Mm-hmm. We also talked about you guys deciding what relationships your characters have before we start playing. And I actually decided not to have you do that. I want you guys to come up with how you met. If you want to come up with how you met, come up with it after you've started playing your characters, because you don't know how your characters, you don't know how you're going to be playing your character yet. Right. Yeah. You might have an idea, but as with every, every character idea I've had it, they always end up changing at least a bit after the first few sessions. Sure. So it's better to, Get you playing your character first and foremost, and then give you information, then let you make dis- decisions based on what happens in the game. You know, does that does that make any sense? Yeah. Yeah. It is a tough thing because you, you've you crafted this huge world. You want the players to know about it. You want the players to be invested in it. You want the players to see that cool little, like, kernel of awesome lore that you came up with. But if you try to give it to them right at the beginning, it's n- that, that kernel is not going to grow into a... Uh, popcorn plant or whatever that <laughs> a kernel does you <laughs> you you want to give them as fertile of a ground as possible so that then you can start planting the seeds for sure for popcorn later on it's like yeah when you buy it when you buy a like a toy for a cat yeah or like you like you buy a bed or something for a cat mm-hmm. cat like you give it to the cat the cat's like i don't the cat sleeps in the box yeah it sleeps in the box it's like, i don't care about this <laughs> <laughs> it's like so you, you got it so you have to hide that bed somewhere mm-hmm. when the cat's not looking and it'll find it it'll be like oh this is great yeah yeah you never told me about this <laughs> no one ever told me about this they're hiding this from sure i'm sure. gonna sit in it i'm gonna sit in it right now <laughs> this is mine now yep it's pretty sweet i found this <laughs> you could also if you are going to give them like a toy you're not going to lay out 20 toys in front of the cat and be like, all right, play with all of them right now. <laughs> you're going to get one toy and you're going to like dangle it in front of their face. You're going to actively get them to paw at it. <laughs> and then you're going to keep doing that until they are playing with it on their own. I'm sorry. I started this. Uh, we're <laughs> referring to players as cats. <laughs> so so you take your keys, you jingle them in right, front yeah, of the door. The jingle, the jingle in the keys. <laughs> Yeah. You know, open the door, barbarian. Come on. Come on. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I didn't. I didn't even mean to tie it into <laughs> sure. uh, to the previous question. I was referring back to a previous episode where we referred right. to little kids as pets. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Come on, little Timmy. There you go. There you go. Uh, yeah. So, so <laughs> the best answer I can give for you know giving new information to your players about the campaign world is give them as little as possible. Yeah. As little as necessary. Yes. And then give it, give them more and more as they get more involved in the game. Yeah, because yeah, you want your char- you want your players to get invested in their characters first, mm-hmm. and then they can get invested in the story. Because right. Then you know, 
and uh, I'll even say one more thing. Anytime I play a video game that starts out with like a 15 minute cutscene uh, about I skip. the about the well, if you can skip it, yeah, skip it. But like, if I have to sit through 15 minutes of oh, and then this kingdom fought this other kingdom. Okay, yeah, I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna learn about this. Uh, never, I'm gonna play a different game. Yeah, you know. <laughs> I mean, although there can be some long-winded like cutscenes and stuff that like don't give you a lot of information, mm-hmm. but they're still just very like, all right, just let me get to the game. Yeah, <laughs> and I'm not saying that this will always be the case. Every now and then, that you'll meet that one like legendary player who wants to read your entire campaign primer, sure, and will remember everything in it. But I feel like Chris would be like one of those guys, right? I think so. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. Um, I tried reading the Greyhawk Gazetteer, which was like the Greyhawk campaign book, mm-hmm. and it was the driest thing. I it, it burst into flames right in front of my eyes. It was so dry. <laughs> and then Chris was like, yeah, I read the whole thing. It wasn't good, but I read the whole thing. Dang. Oh, jeez. Anyway, um, <laughs> but yeah, you, you might encounter a player that is interested in all of that. Yeah. Worry about that when it happens. Don't expect every player to be that way right. until they have established themselves as yeah. being that way. Yeah, you don't. Yeah, you don't want to. If you if you got a great story you want to tell, don't force it on anybody. Yeah, because then they're just not going to be. And interested. I mean, it might be great. Yeah, but if you force it on somebody, they're not going to think it's great, no matter how great it is. Yeah, you know yeah. What I mean? All right. Well, I think that'll do it for our regular questions for today. Uh, but we do have our social media questions. So our previous social media question was what is the longest tabletop campaign you've been a part of? Do you recall what your answer was, Jeff? Um, I think I think it was the uh, the Age of Worms. I think so. I think um, that, that ran the longest. Yeah, we had our Age of Worms campaign. We had Jay's Eberron campaign. Mm-hmm. Those were uh, both around a year, maybe a little over a year, yeah. I want to say. Um, I was also in a the group where I played as Ichi with Chris. Dang. And I... Um, I was in a game where I played as my character Artemis Red Sleeves. Those are like the four full campaigns that I could say, like full many level campaigns that I've played. Not all of them were from first level to 20th level. Mm-hmm. The Ichi campaign was like eighth to 21st or something. The Artemis Red Sleeves one was first to eighth. And then we jumped to 12th for the last adventure, but all of them were around the same amount of time. And uh, all of them were really good. I think probably probably Age of Worms was probably the longest one. Yeah, because that one I think we did go from one to like twenty. One to twenty. I think Steve might have been twenty first or twenty second or, or something. Or no, wait. Or I no, th- Steve no, was behind because he was yeah, making magic items. I think I think we were we were at like twenty or twenty first by the end. I don't, I don't remember, but yeah. whatever the case, it was a good good long solid. Yeah, campaign. for sure. Uh, so on Facebook, we didn't get a ton of responses for this one, but that's that's fine with me. Uh, on Facebook, Brandon says 3.0 campaign for a year and change made it to level 11. We had players come and go. It ended when my best friend Sorcerer Fighter did not get along with the party bard. It created some friction that some call inter-party conflict. Oh. We haven't used the inter-party conflict ding, ding in a very long time. Oh, man. We use the Age of Worms ding more than we use the inter-party conflict ding. Probably. <laughs> anyway, uh, Andrew says, My group has just reached 15th level in a 5th edition D&D campaign. We started four years ago Congrats. with bi-weekly play. Congratulations. I, That's, yeah, a bi-weekly play, four years. Like, just continuing to play a campaign, I, that's... That's good. That's good. That's, congratulations. Yeah, congratulations. Very jealous. I do very much feel like all of the games that we've played, we've leveled pretty fast. I mean, yeah. at least at least in the Age of Worms and uh, and Jay Zebron campaign, yeah. leveling so fun though. It is so fun, and like it's fun to throw big set piece monsters at players. Uh-huh. So like it's it's fun to give them a lot of experience, and also probably a big part of it is we do like I think we as a group we we liked giving out XP for uh, for good role playing and clever ideas. Sure. So there were probably situations where over the course of a campaign you might get an extra level or two. Based purely on like you guys did some really good role playing in that one, so have a level on good behavior. You know? I mean, I guess, I guess. <laughs> so yeah, I think a lot of people do play slower games than we do. Sure, it's not that they are better or worse. Just well, different. I mean, you know, and, and like we say, like it's impressive that they played for four years straight. Yeah, we don't yeah. have that much. We, you know, we don't necessarily have that much time, so that we we want to play more a more condensed game. Basically. Sure, sure. Yeah, I I was primarily looking for uh 
um, length of time rather than length of levels. Sure, sure. Know. But I mean, four years. Yeah, four years. That's that's a big achievement right yep. there. Uh, the DM's council says two and a half years, meeting every Monday for five to six hours. Two and a half years every week. Yeah. So that's that's, that's pretty big. That's like that's just as many, if not more, sessions than the other one. That, yeah. Like, that's, yeah, that's a lot of D&D. Yeah, that's crazy. Uh, over on Reddit... Uh, zero zero Jiminy Cricket says, I'm still new to D&D, so my campaigns are also new. But this got me thinking, did those long campaigns start at level one and go to 15 or 20? And yeah, so I responded to that with the the levels that like the campaigns I've been in have, have gone from. And so, yeah, anytime someone says like that they got to a certain level, it's hard to make a judgment on the length of... It's hard to make any sort of a judgment based on right. purely on the level. Yeah, Because like, you can start at any level you want, technically. Exactly. And like we just said, like, you know, experience... Getting out experience is different for every group. Yeah, yeah. So Some people go by milestones, so you could be just leveling oh, yeah. up every session just for the heck of it. You could, yeah. Um, we didn't get any on Twitter, but over on Discord, Lone Rev says, The longest campaign I've ever been in is the only one I've been in and the one I'm running right now. We've been playing together for six, seven months, and, and I want to thank you, Gabe and Jeff, for being part of the inspiration to get off my butt and get a group going for myself, Aww. in addition to helping me have more of an understanding of game table culture and kind of what's expected. Awesome. So I'm very happy that we could be uh, a an inspiration to help people sure, yeah. play the game, you know. And six to seven months is great. Yes, I've said that I've been in like four complete campaigns, but that's over like 13 years or 14 years or something like that. Very, very few campaigns make it six months. Right. I, I would say. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so when you do, like that is a huge achievement. Good job to you. I know yeah. we, we were just praising somebody for four years, no, but I mean, all of them, but all of these are worth, are, are worthy of praise. Right. So yeah. Congratulations. It's especially if it's, you know, if you're saying it's still ongoing, that's great. Cause you're playing game. You're playing yeah. D right now. Yeah, absolutely. We're very happy. <laughs> right. Adam B says, I'm currently running the longest campaign right now. It's been active two years. Players are currently level 13 and have slowly uncovered more and more of the overall plot. Mm-hmm. I have submitted deaths items and listening to the show alongside crit Academy has helped me when I feel the slow drain of block. Uh, yeah, yeah. So awesome. congratulations on two years. Preston Penguin R says, I was part of three with the same group at the same time. One that I ran lasted about a year and a half. The other two lasted two years. We cycled the campaign, so they didn't run a year really, but very consistent. We met once a week and it spoiled me to a group with great with great attendance. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. Having a group with great attendance is, is worth its weight in gold. Right. Right there. <laughs> Uh, so that's all of our answers for the uh, for the social media question for last week. The question I have for this week is, have you ever encountered a beholder in your game? Oh. If you have, how did it go? Yeah. <laughs> so I don't recall, Jeff. Have you ever encountered a beholder? Uh, yes, actually. I've encountered the same beholder at least twice. Oh, right. Right. <laughs> okay. Well, go on. Tell us, uh, tell us what happened. So it's the, uh, the Shackled City campaign. Mm-hmm. Spoilers for the Shackled City the campaign. The first adventure the of the first Shackled adventure. City campaign. Yeah. But I mean, it's a, it's a good hook, yeah. you know, yeah. it's a good hook, you know? Uh, so yeah, like you, you basically like, if there's a town, some kids go missing, you're mm-hmm. trying to figure out what's happening to these kids. You end up in like this underground there's like an underground slave ring yeah, that's in, a, in the ruins beneath the city right so and then like you you know you f- you find uh you find like one of the missing you find like the missing children or at least one of them or something you find several of them but there's one in particular that's like go, yeah and then so like you go into this room and there's a bunch of big baddies and they're real tough mm-hmm. and like as you're fighting a beholder shows up mm-hmm. and like basically stops the show yeah like Quite literally, in some cases, I feel like. <laughs> right, I, I, right. I felt like a petrification ray happened once or twice. Um, so, yeah, like a beholder shows up and just says, like, all right, no, I'm taking this kid. You mm-hmm. guys stop. Like, cut it out. Yeah. I mean, in, in, in a way that a beholder would. Right, right. Um, so, yeah, like, but I've played I've played the first adventure of this of this campaign. At I've, least twice. At least twice. I'm pretty sure three times. Yeah. I've, I've run it a few times, too. Yeah. I've ran it for somebody in, in a group in Tennessee. I ran it for you guys here. Jay ran it. Uh, yeah, so that that's definitely an interesting mm. part of that adventure. Yeah, because it's it's the first adventure, and you f- you see a beholder, right? And the DM prays that the <laughs> players aren't stupid enough to attack it. <laughs> well, so I so I th- I two distinct times that I've run that encounter, I I dealt with it different ways. There was one time I ran that where because. The players are not meant to fight this beholder. It is right. a first level adventure. The players might be level two or three by this point. If they attack this beholder, they are going to die. 
or the DM has to awkwardly just be like, oh, the Beholder decides not to use one of its 10 abilities on you right. as you are stabbing it with a dagger or whatever. Um, so the very first time I did it, I ran the, when the, you know, I was running the encounter, the Beholder shows up and I took everybody out of initiative. And then I had the other big bads sort of like argue with the Beholder and the Beholder was like, no, I got to take this boy. I'm, I'm, I'm out. Peace. Um, but because I stopped rounds, I stopped the encounter and then the encounter started up again. But for that moment, I immediately gave the players an indication you're not supposed to fight this Beholder. Yeah. That I think is it it is good and bad. Right. I'm not saying that you should or shouldn't do this because it does activate a metagame part of the player's mind. Oh, we're out of rounds. Okay, I don't have to be afraid that we're supposed to fight a Beholder at level one. So the tension may not go away entirely because you don't know what that Beholder is going to do, but it does, it did go down somewhat. Yeah. The next time when I ran it for you guys, I had the Beholder show up. Okay. Yeah. It's your turn. What do you do? Like we kept going in rounds and nobody did attack the Beholder. I think because you guys are seasoned players and you realized that Beholder is going to kill me. But that I think made it a lot scarier sure. because... We're still in rounds. There is now a beholder in the combat. What do I do? Do I attack the guy I was attacking or do I run or do I attack the beholder? You know? Yeah. So a- anyway, uh, that that is a great, a great encounter. Yeah, that's fun. Um, and if we had ever continued beyond that adventure, <laughs> that beholder does have a part in the campaign, possibly a very big part, depending on how it goes. Uh, anyway. In an actual game as a player, I think the only time I've encountered a Beholder... I mean, I guess I was in the same Shackled City thing, but uh, the only other time I've encountered a Beholder was in the campaign with Ichi. We were in a dungeon. A Beholder shows up. We roll initiative. Chris's character wins initiative. He was playing a rogue fighter with a serrated and laminated katana. (laughs) He ran up. He had uh, boots of speed. So he ran up and then full attacked the Beholder and managed to kill it in a single round. If he hadn't done that, we would have all been screwed. Like it was, it was over as soon as it began, and we all bra- breathed a collective sigh of relief because it would have wrecked us. Right. <laughs> he just he got enough crits in that round. Sure. And like luck of the dice. Luck of the dice to go first. Exactly. Luck of the exactly. Dice. And like I think it was even specific that the beholder did not have its main eye open because that would have. I he might have still been able to kill it. I don't know, but mm. it would have reduced his damage a bit. Well, he definitely wouldn't have been able to get a full attack because uh, he would have he would, his boots of speed wouldn't have worked. That's right. Yeah. Anyway, so that one that one was definitely a, a situation. There's <laughs> also a game that I ran where it was a pre-written adventure I got off Wizards.com where there's a, a they the players go into a town of friendly monsters and the surgeon in town is a beholder. Oh, so and he has <laughs> nice. he has a little lens on his uh, disintegrate ray. That lets on his disintegrate eye stock that lets him use it as like a laser so he can like make perform incisions like make stuff. incisions and stuff. Yeah, <laughs> that's cool. Um, oh, one beholder that uh, you and I have encountered together is in the Dungeons and Dragons uh, arcade game. Oh, of course. Yeah. Of course. I, I wasn't counting that, but that that's a great, <laughs> great suggestion. Yeah. Yeah. Where it took us a while to figure out like he like turns and like opens his eyes so you yeah. can't use magic in that. And I think. Sometimes when you hit him, you can cut off his eye stalks. Am I correct? I think it, that might just be like as you're doing damage. To Pro- them, probably, they, they, probably. They slowly come off. But yeah. But yeah. We've, we've... Yeah, that was that was a good encounter. I now I want to play that game. Right. <laughs> yeah, it was like the choice between like <laughs> basically like do we want to go fight a red dragon or go into the cave? We're like, we're not going to fight a dragon. We're going to go to this cave. And then in the cave was a beholder. Like, a beholder, crap. yeah. <laughs> I don't think that's better. That's right. not better. <laughs> oh, man. That was great. Yeah, so um, let us know what your uh, your answers are. I think yeah. somebody was asking about that on, uh, I think, in a D&D group I was a part of on Facebook. And I thought that would make a good a good question in uh, in our discussion questions. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, we'll, so let us know on social media what you think. And uh, you might end up on a future episode. Cool. All right. Well, uh, let us, uh, I guess, wind down a little bit so we can uh, let's let's. Take a deep breath. I always say, let's take a deep breath after I've taken a deep breath. You can probably hear it just now. I <laughs> I took a deep breath and then said it. So let's take a deep breath. <sighs> and let's sit back. Let's remember the people who have come before us, possibly who have fought beholders and 
died <laughs> as we toss another log onto the funeral pyre. This funeral pyre story comes from Adam B. on Discord. Unfortunately, in our recent game, two of our party members fell. So they, you know, they can get back up, right? Yeah, it's just prone. It's just you just have your <laughs> right. movement to get up. During the wedding of the party's wood elf druid, several scouts warned of encroaching minotaurs. The party decided to intervene on the wood elves' behalf, whereupon they raced through the woods to a large open glade. Within the glade, the grass stood over ten feet tall, blocking all line of sight. Mm. The party then used the ranger's giant owl to scout and discovered there was a dozen large invisible shapes proceeding through the grass and one huge shape. The tabaxi bard and dwarf barbarian Vulcus threw caution to the wind and charged into the grass. This forced the party's hand and forced them into the grass, whereupon the invisibility dropped from the 11 minotaur warriors, one shaman, and the large beast being dragged along in chains known as a jabber slithe. Ugh. The group attacked without hesitation, and a fight ensued. The Jabber Slythe was resistant to most forms of damage and caused creatures within a certain distance to suffer madness on a failed save. Ouch. Unfortunately, most of the group failed, leaving the human wild magic sorcerer Luna and Dwarf Barbarian being the only two able to fight effectively. Eventually, they whittled the Jabber Slythe down, and the Barbarian swung his axe as the sorcerer cast Mind Prison. The creature failed and wasn't resistant to psychic, so finally died. This triggered its death ability, causing a giant wave of damage and madness, instantly killing the sorcerer and felling the barbarian. The party druid had only one spell slot left, and after a huge debate, decided to reincarnate the sorcerer, returning her into a wood elf and leaving the body of the barbarian as it was his wish to die in battle and rejoin his family in the hall of their ancestors. May you walk in pride, Vulcus. Ooh, I like that. That's pretty good. Well, I don't have a better send-off than that, so let's raise a glass. Clink. Clink. So that'll do it for today. To submit questions for us to discuss, items for the Dragon's Horde, or stories for the Funeral Pyre, please email us at interpartyconflict at gmail.com. For show notes, links to media mentioned on the show, and running lists of questions and magic items, go to interpartyconflict.com. Join the discussion on social media. Find us on Facebook, facebook.com slash interpartyconflict, on Reddit at r slash interpartyconflict, on our interparty Discord, or on Twitter at inpartyconflict for our weekly social media questions. Your answers might end up on the show. Find us on iTunes, Google Play Music, Stitcher, YouTube, anywhere you download podcasts. Please rate, review, subscribe, or just tell a friend. If you'd like to support the show, check out the rewards at patreon.com slash interpartyconflict. There's a few different tiers, so anything you can spare, even a dollar a month, would go towards making the show better, and you'll get bonus content for it. Jeff, tell us about FriendQuest. FriendQuest is a YouTube channel where we play video games. Yes. Speaking of video games, you can check out my side project, the Arcade Memories Podcast. If you'd like to submit your own childhood memories of going to the arcade, record them or write them to me at arcadememoriespodcast at gmail.com. Also, head over to bit.ly slash interpartyconflict to take a short survey about our show, what you like, what you don't like, etc. And just for taking it, you'll get two free printable board games, courtesy of Mary and Tom over at hollandspiel.com. And our music is made by Boxcat Games from Nameless the Hackers RPG. So, Jeff, until next time, just open that door. There you go. There you go.